¡Hey! ¿Qué pasa? Bienvenidos a todos. Eh, no es un gameplay. Esta vez no es un gameplay. Esta vez, eh, tras haberme acabado el juego de la manera un poco más regular posible, que es de 6, eh, solo he sobrevivido dos personas. Así que me toca rejugarlo. Eh, simplemente vamos a ver los contenidos especiales que he desbloqueado. Eh, creo que son 3 de 5. Supongo que los cinco contenidos es cuando llegas con todos los cinco o seis personajes vivos. Así que vamos a ver eh, qué es lo que hay, lo que había bloqueado y lo que he desbloqueado. La primera historia se llama la historia del terror antológico. Antológico. Y vamos a ver. The horror anthology is much loved and has an established pedigree across all forms of entertainment. From twice told tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1837 to Clive Barker's books of blood in the mid 80s and with the likes of Blackwood, Poe and Lovecraft in between, short story horror writing has long been a popular format. Largely regarded as the first published horror anthology, Twice Told Tales is a collection of mostly previously published stories from The Token, an annual illustrated gift book published in Boston. The author of Twice Told Tales, Daniel Hawthorne, was born on July the 4th, 1804, in Salem, Massachusetts. His great-great-grandfather was John Haythorne, a Puritan, and one of the judges who presided at the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. In 1842, Edgar Allan Poe reviewed Twice Told Tales for Graham's magazine, concluding that Hawthorne was a man of indisputable genius. By this time, Poe, also from the state of Massachusetts, had already written his own collection of short stories for publication. This collection, titled Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque, was published in two volumes in 1839. The horror anthology had become a recognized format. And after also writing many short stories for newspapers and magazines, Algernon Blackwood's first publication, The Empty House and Other Ghost Stories, was released in 1906. Blackwood went on to write such classics as The Willows and The Wendigo, which was first published in another anthology, The Lost Valley and Other Stories, in 1910. Fast forward 74 years to 1984, and the first publication of Books of Blood, Each book was a collection of horror stories written by British author Clive Barker, the first of which catapulted Barker to legendary status in horror writing, with Stephen King proclaiming him the future of horror. Several of the stories from Books of Blood have been adapted successfully for film, including Rawhead Rex and The Midnight Meat Train. Barker adapted The Yattering Jack in 1986 for use in George A. Romero's anthology TV series, Tales from the Dark Side. I take it, we will remain. Short form storytelling arrived on a new medium in 1938 when the radio show, The Mercury Theatre on Air, broadcast an adaptation of Dracula. I have never seen Count Dracula by day. At sunrise, at the first cock, Chloe is gone. The series was the creation of Orson Welles and John Houseman, and became most famous for its broadcast of War of the Worlds, which terrified listeners, believing that the alien invasion was a reality. From 1942, the radio drama series Suspense broadcast more than 90 short plays on CBS radio for 20 years, often featuring some of Hollywood's leading stars. Initially, the series seldom used material that would be classified as horror, fantasy, or science fiction, but by the late 50s, this became a regular occurrence, including material such as H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. One episode, The Hitchhiker, broadcast in 1942, featured a performance by Orson Welles and was later adapted for an episode of The Twilight Zone in 1960. 1947 saw the debut of Quiet Please, a radio horror and fantasy series created by Willis Cooper. Cooper had been a writer for Orson Welles' Campbell Playhouse, which had succeeded the Mercury Theatre on Air. Which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for tonight is called 
Camera obscura. The play's scripts often broke the fourth wall by speaking directly to the listener, a technique much adopted in later horror anthologies. In his book, Terror on the Air, Horror Radio in America, Richard J. Hand wrote that Cooper had enjoyed creating roles for the audience, including implicating them in the action of the story itself, indicating a clear desire to create horror as interactive entertainment more than 70 years ago. The show ran for two years. Forward 50 more years in radio, and in October 2010, we see the debut of Larry Fessenden and Glenn McQuaid's radio show, Tales from Beyond the Pale. Successful genre filmmakers in their respective rights, the two began producing episodes under Fessenden's studio, Glass Eye Picks, influenced by the works of Boris Karloff, Peter Lorre, and Orson Welles. Fessenden would later partner with the show's sound designer, Graham Resnick, to write the scripts for supermassive games critically acclaimed horror debut Until Dawn, and for the first game in their Dark Pictures horror anthology, Man of Medan. In film and TV, short format horror has been successfully represented many times since The Twilight Zone in 1959. Created and presented by Rod Serling, The Twilight Zone ran for five seasons on CBS from 1959 to 1964. Each show was a standalone story featuring characters faced by surreal and often disturbing events. Serling's introductions and conclusions to each show summarized the story and provided some justification for the events and, often, the moral of the story. In 2016, Rolling Stone placed The Twilight Zone at number seven in its list of the greatest shows of all time. The 1972 film, Tales from the Crypt, is highly regarded by fans of the genre. Starring Peter Cushing and Joan Collins and featuring Ralph Richardson as the Crypt Keeper, it is an anthology film based on stories from EC Comics and one of several amicus horror anthologies produced in that decade. And in 1989, HBO launched a horror anthology series under the same name, also based on EC Comics, which ran until July 1996. 1982 saw the release of Creepshow, a dark comic horror anthology film directed by George A. Romero. Influenced by and a homage to the material from the EC and DC comics of the 1950s, its entirely original material was written by Stephen King, and it is a somewhat tongue-in-cheek expression of the horror genre. 25 years on, and in 2007, Trick or Treat presents another set of horror shorts as a dark comedy horror anthology film. And then, in 2012, a very different anthology film with a very different tone, VHS. Created by Brad Miska and Bloody Disgusting, an American horror genre website and film production company, VHS is a much darker horror anthology film. Comprising six short horror stories and linked by a found footage theme, two of the stories, Second Honeymoon and Tuesday the 17th, were written and directed by Ty West and Glenn McQuaid. Other examples in film and TV that are more than worthy of mention are Roger Corman's 1962 anthology, Tales of Terror, based on three Edgar Allan Poe short stories and featuring Peter Lorre, Vincent Price and Basil Rathbone. The 1963 Italian horror anthology, Black Sabbath, narrated by Boris Karloff, the TV series Night Gallery, a spiritual successor to, or certainly a close relative of, The Twilight Zone, fronted again by Rod Serling and focusing more directly on horror, which ran from 1969 to 1973. Stephen King's Cat's Eye of 1985. John Carpenter's 1993 film Body Bags, featuring the likes of Sam Raimi, Wes Craven and Mark Hamill. And Southbound a 2016 road trip horror anthology by a number of the collaborators on VHS. From written fiction through radio, cinema and TV and now video games, 
Horror Anthology is a format that both creators and horror fans enjoy. And it's a format that has existed for almost 200 years. Long may it continue. Qué interesante la historia de las antologías de terror. La verdad es que está, ha estado chulo el documental. Vamos a ver ahora Bufón de la Corte. Hey, what's up, man? Conrad. Good to finally meet you, Conrad. This is Brad, by the way, my little bro. Hey, man. Want to crack a cold one with me? In The Man of Medan, I play a character named Conrad. And I think initially when we find Conrad, he is a sort of entitled guy, a wealthy American who's on vacation. But where's the old crust bucket skipper anyhow? He's an adventurous guy. He lives off the cuff. He does what he wants. I'd invite you to make yourselves at home, but... Uh... And I think that's kind of fun to play as an actor. He has no sensor, he's no filter. So whatever circumstance he's put into, you know exactly how Conrad feels. And so it was kind of fun performance to start out being brash, kind of a silly guy, and just jump in and have fun with that. So is everybody on board and ready to go? Uh, you're selling, I'm buying. I think Conrad and I have some similarities. I think the sense of humor and the sense of fun are similar between Conrad and I, but I will say that he's a little more aggressive and a little more outlandish than I am. Guys, look, I think we gotta listen to our experienced, beautiful, smart, and beautiful captain here. If she says we should do things Connie, the right- please, I didn't bring you on this trip to get laid. Wait, what? I think Conrad's <laughs> the kind of guy that I would like to be at a party with. You know, I'd like to have a barbecue and drink some beers with him. I don't know that Conrad and I would be best friends. I think we'd butt heads a little bit. Right on, Bradical. I like the cut of your ship. It's jib. Don't ruin it. I think the scenes that I've had the most fun with so far are basically when Conrad is going absolutely crazy. I don't want to give too much away, but there's a scene where these, these sort of fishermen interact with our divers, with our core crew here, and He's just a bit of an asshole. Hey, we got damage here, you see this? We can take care of this, man, it's not a problem. I mean, what do you think, like 10 bucks cover it? Oh, whoops, my bad, let's make it 20. Okay, okay, hold on, I got this. Well, shoot, you, you think it's more like 30? I can do 30. All right, you drive a hard bargain, but I'm with you. Here, you know what, let's just throw in the whole pot. That's yours, you go ahead. Let's go. No! He just got an attitude. He's brash. These people are messing with his group, and he just kind of lets loose and talks trash to him. And as a guy who would never do that in real life, it's uh, a lot of fun to just kind of let Conrad flow, say whatever he wants. You are an idiot. They left, didn't they? That doesn't make you any less of an idiot. You know, the only thing funnier than seeing you try to buy your way out of that situation is watching you put your money to waste. Got a smile out of you. Worth every penny. I got one of the most interesting and one of the key moments that sticks out for me is Conrad's decision in the first act of the game either to stay with the group or potentially just take off. Storm's eight miles away. They came here on a boat. Maybe we can take it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a speedboat. I can get out through the window. We gotta break these off first. Too loud. They'll hear it. But we're gonna break them during the thunder. <sighs> Good call. Don't leave us here, okay? And I think, again, this is what's interesting. Depending on how the player sculpts the story, Conrad can become a coward, essentially, and desert his friends and his family, or become a hero and stay. These fuckers need to pay. So that, to me, is very, very interesting. Two very human choices, and depending on how our player decides to live with these characters, can totally change the outcome of the game. So I think that I enjoy when Conrad makes the heroic choice and gets to stick around. He obviously gets to see more of the adventure, but it's just as possible that he tries to save his own life and takes off. Ooh, wow, that was intense. <laughs> That's one way to put it. You got a better way to put it? All the characters do have very strong personalities and drives. Leave, leave, leave! I think Conrad is the instigator. Good news, bad news, bad news. I don't see how this could get any worse. I think he is the one that really starts <laughs> the confrontation with the fishermen. These are kind of 
Maybe the fisherman I pissed off earlier. Oh, God damn it, Conrad. Great, just great. And the good news? So I think in a lot of ways, Conrad is there to stir the pot and create drama. Uh, I recognize them. How is that good news? I thought you were gonna ask the good news first. You're such an idiot, Jesus. Do I prefer playing the good guy or the bad guy? I think that there's, there's fun in both. To be honest, I don't get to play the bad guy as much as I get to play the good guy, so I think I relish those moments where I get to play the darker side of things. But I think every good hero has that balance, has that dark side. I think a good guy who only is doing good things is kind of boring. You just had to piss them off, didn't you? So I think that there's elements of both sides in both characters. And the best villains are the villains that don't think they're doing anything wrong. Their motivation is not like, oh, I'm a mustache twirling bad guy. It's like, no, they're doing what's right for them. It just happens to be against what most people think is the right thing to do. If I can't shoot them as payback, at least I could give them a nice jab with a sharp knife. Because I'd had some experience working with motion capture and games before, this experience was much easier for me coming right in. I didn't feel like I was jumping into the deep end. What I really like is that all the actors are constantly there all the time. There's the ability to work off each other without the pressure of specific lighting and marks. There's a freedom to that that I really, really enjoy. It's been really good. It's been very kind of a free experience as far as like motion capture performance. You got a funny way of saying, thank you, Conrad. You're a piece of work, Conrad. I'm not all work, I'm a little play, too. Hashtag wink. Pues a Conrad fue el primero que me mataron. Y ahora viendo este documental, el making of, con, con Conrad, eh, la verdad es que me dan ganas de volver a jugar y elegir porque yo me fui con la barca elegir quedarme y coger el cuchillo para ver qué pasa así que es muy interesante eh, este juego para rejugarlo y rejugarlo y rejugarlo vamos a ver la creación del conservador hello I am the curator the curator of stories, stories of love and hate, greed and beauty, life and death, stories such as this one. The curator of the Dark Pictures Anthology bridges between the player and the story being very aware of what they've done, but also much more aware than the player about what's actually going on in the story and what the context is and what the scenario is. What do you think happened to this guy? Now, for the first time, for some reason that he himself doesn't even understand, he's been given the opportunity to talk to somebody, and that somebody is the player. As far as he knows, it's always been him that's done this job, and nobody else. And within his library is the story of everybody's life and death. There's even rooms in there that he can't remember ever going in, but he's way too busy to go and explore because there's always another end of life to record and document. Clothes are so important because they provide an insight into the character. They explain where the character's been, they describe where he's going, they suggest motive. We want the audience to perceive him as having everything completely in control. So all of the ideas of his clothes being tailored to his body, it's really important to us. We worked with a costume designer. He did a lot of research into the authenticity of the materials and textures. He provided us with lots of authentic high resolution reference. He even gave us material swatches. It was really useful for us because looking at the folds, looking at the visual language of cloth, how do they sit on the character? Is it working from a distance? What's the weight of the material? It gave us a really good platform in order to produce high quality realistic materials. I'm here to record the story you choose to tell. I think that whenever you're dealing with a realistic human acting performance and facial expressions, that part of it is so key to transferring the emotion that you want to over to the player. Just the definition and detail that you need now is quite challenging. But there are repercussions. 
In terms of cameras, it's quite interesting as well because we've talked a little bit before about how we use skewed angles, upshots, tilts and all that kind of thing to create this feeling of unease and anxiety in the horror moments. And for the curator, it was quite the opposite, actually. He's very much in control and he knows everything about the game you're playing and he's very much at home in his own environment. So we took the approach to have a lot more flattering shots, a lot more level shots. You look at him at a natural height. You're never like below or above him and it creates this veneer of control it's almost like it's very straightforward and he's just delivering you these statements you see we each make decisions according to our own moral compass and of course he's british as soon as we'd established that and who he was and what his personality was our minds went pretty much straight to pip torrens to deliver the performance and pip's done a brilliant job bringing everything that we wanted in the curator to life on the screen and pretty much everything that we shot was nailed on first take by Pip. But the truth of this story isn't fixed. Far from it. A story can change a great deal when told from a different perspective. One thing that was really important for us with the art direction was to somehow differentiate him from the rest of the game that you're experiencing. And with that, we could make a really interesting contrast because as the player, you might be experiencing all this horror, all this craziness, and all of a sudden you're taken out to quite a different and quite an unusual place. So that was a really fun thing to play with. We tried to play up on that contrast and really signal to the player that there was a change happening. The curator addresses the player directly. He's quite ambiguous, he's quite mysterious. You're really not sure if he's there to help you or hinder you sometimes. And I wanted that to kind of be reflected in the art. The corridor that he is in at the start of the game and where you see him a lot of times, we wanted to get this feel of an almost infinite corridor that's got this maze-like feel. It's not a set out space that you automatically understand as a viewer when you see it. You're not sure how long it goes on, how many paths there are, how much of a maze this corridor is. So to light that, we wanted to get this feel where there's not markers that tell you this is where you are right now in the corridor, you've been here before just to increase that feeling of not being fully aware of your surroundings and add to the mystery of the scene. And then he goes into his repository, which is a huge vault of books and secrets with his main desk right in the middle. He's got large windows for light, a skylight above that would also let a lot of light in, a mezzanine floor, a marble fireplace, classical, opulent, sophisticated. The central feature of the repository is the curator's desk. So we researched how that might look and wanted to make it look a big, substantial piece of furniture. We added a lot of scroll work and detail to the front and rear. All of the things that you'd expect, the brass fittings for the drawers. There's quite a lot of detail went into that and we thought we might be seeing that quite close as well again. So in the end, it fits nicely within its environment. It references some of the Victorian era detail that you might see on a piece like that. The creator has the ability to access stories through the pictures on the wall. They're almost portaled through to another world. And that all had to fit within our architectural environment. So we looked at very ornate framings, large pictures that would hang on the walls that would feel correct and not out of place and something of this nature. We thought about where we could include light sources that would be interesting and would put light in the right areas of the room. The skylight's a really good example. We decided that having this top-down ambience would really bed the scene in nicely and create this nice veneer to it. And then add in another number of interesting light sources that we can use for accents, such as a fireplace, such as the candles, that just are there to give you that extra range of colour if you need it. They're there to draw the eye of the player to what we want to show them. It's not my place to interfere, but I might be persuaded to offer the occasional hint. Here's one for free. It's a strange place. Who, who is this guy? Why is he talking to me? Where am I now? I, you know, I was just on a ship having some horror happening, and now I'm here. And this guy has the appearance of being there to help you, but he seems like such a strange guy, and the environment he's in is so different. There's a certain ambiguity to it, and we wanted the player to question whether or not he's on their side, or whether or not he's kind of playing his own game with them. The curator's no ordinary person and his repository is no ordinary place. And you'll get the chance to see him again in the rest of the Dark Pictures anthology. We will meet again. It's inevitable. El curator es ese ser tan misterioso, el que está ahí en la pantalla, 
que seguro que es el nexo de unión de todos los juegos que es antología. No sé cuántos serán, ¿tres juegos? ¿Cuatro? No lo sé. Bueno, me quedan dos, el secreto de Uran Medan y el Uran Medan parte 2, que es del barco, pero me imagino que según esto hay que desbloquearlo, encontrar 25 secretos o 50 secretos y yo no los he encontrado. Así que hay que rejugar el juego. Bueno, muchas gracias. Espero que hoy os haya gustado este vídeo, que simplemente están los vídeos, los documentales de Making Off. Y nos vemos en el próximo gameplay, vídeo, making of, eh, algo que tenga que ver con los videojuegos. Muchas gracias, gracias por verme, suscribiros y chao.